Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. Welcome to this premiere episode of the new season of The Extraordinary. Tonight we have a special two-part story of a unique man who has for many fundamentally changed the definition of life and death. His name is George Anderson. No matter what your personal beliefs about the hereafter, you may want to reserve your judgment on Anderson until you've seen the whole story. Death. It is the first and final question that consumes all of us almost from the day we are born. From the beginning of time, man has tried to answer it with real or imagined gods, rituals of resurrection, hope in the hereafter. For only in death do we entrust an answer to the meaning of life. Until it comes to each of us individually, we grasp for clues, especially during times of grief over the death of loved ones. Are they really gone? Is their spirit somewhere out there still? Many search through prayer, some through mystics, mediums or perceived messages in dreams. Between the living and the dead, there is the everlasting search for contact. And then there is this man, George Anderson. She just wants to let everybody know that she's all right and at peace. Please tell me you heard from mom, you heard from Helen. You worry too much, she says. And when the water's calm, you're afraid where's the shark? As he scribbles randomly on a notepad, he talks to the dead. Thousands throughout the world believe he is the link, the one who for the first time in the quest of the living has achieved contact with the departed. If it is true, then the powers that decide such things have made an unlikely choice. In all other matters, Anderson is exceptional only in the ordinariness of his life. He is a meticulous man who does his own laundry, lives in a suburban house in middle-class America, and is fastidious about such things as paying his mortgage on time. Nevertheless, there is a two-year waiting list of the living desperate to attend a session in which George might contact their dead. The phenomenon that creates such obsession is there in titles of books written about his work. We don't die. We are not forgotten. Our children forever. The author of these books, Joel Martin, was once extremely doubtful. He's now convinced. When you rule out all of the other possibilities of what it might be, you are left with only one possibility. For lack of anything else, you have got to conclude that what George is doing is receiving messages somehow from the souls of the departed. Martin's belief is a total reversal. He hosted a radio program that debunked frauds, psychics and mediums. But when Martin attended his first session with George, it changed him forever. In 1979, my former wife was killed. She hit by a car and killed crossing a street in New York City. He's lost a wife recently. He described what she um, looked like. Yes, yeah, she was very young. And I, I'm, I'm sensing uh, metal, some sort of uh, concussion, uh, possibly a car accident. He knew where the injury was, something I did not know. And then when he went like this, She's pointing her finger at I She's got very, very like upset. This. I grabbed onto She him. continues to go back and forth with her finger. Uh, I don't... I can't make out exactly what she's doing. I think she might be scolding you or she something. Go like this, always go like this. And I'm saying to myself, my God, how could he possibly know that mannerism? It is not something I would ever have told anybody. It's not something he could really have researched. It was a very private thing that only two people in the world could know, me or her. Now, as far as I know, she's dead. We set up our own test of Anderson's supposed ability, all recorded on tape. This policeman's widow lost her husband in a gunfight, and three years later, suffered the double tragedy of her five-year-old son's death under the wheels of a car. 
George Anderson was told nothing about the woman but her first name. He had no way of knowing about her two tragedies. Listen to his first words. Slowly but surely, a male close to you passed over? Yes. Two? Yes. One younger, one older? Yes. Two different generations. We will see more of that session later. But first, a few facts about George and the lengths he has gone to test the validity of his claims. EEG and thermography tests indicate that his brain waves exhibit a sleeping state and his body temperature is elevated while he is in session or contact. George seems genuinely open-minded and curious about his own ability. I'm still very cynical about it. Not that I don't believe in what I'm doing, but I'm still looking for proof too. We were brought up not to believe this. We were brought up, these things don't happen, these things don't exist. We're, we're taught in religion as such to believe in a life hereafter, believe in this, believe in that, but we really do not see anything. Miracles don't happen as they did in the Bible or centuries ago. Something is happening, most definitely. Something is happening. It's, not, it's no joke, it's not a fake. Something really is happening. And I'm just as curious as anybody else to find out how it is or how it works. If you can prove to me beyond a question of a doubt that it is a unique type of mental telepathy, that it's not what I think it is, you're not going to break my heart. As I've said before, and I'll say it again, if it weren't for this ability, I basically would be an atheist. At six, George developed chickenpox with a massive fever and came close to death. When he recovered, he says he was left with what he calls the affliction of seeing the future. Affliction because his premonitions of death caused not only resentment, but during his teens, the threat of being institutionalized. Today, thousands try to get through on his appointment line, and sessions are booked only under first names. At the reading, George instructs them to volunteer no information about themselves or the departed. Whatever I say to you as we begin, please just say yes or no, and let's see. Martin says George's accuracy is near 90%, and that even his apparent mistakes aren't quite the failures they seem. What happens is that George has got to interpret symbols. George has got to interpret sensations and then logically translate them. George may feel a pain in the chest. A pain in the chest could be a heart attack. A pain in the chest could be pneumonia. A pain in the chest could be somebody shot in the chest, stabbed in the chest, some kind of projectile through the chest. Martin's acceptance of Anderson's amazing abilities led to his books about people whose lives changed after George's reading. One that stays with him is the case of a heartbroken father who lost his little girl to cerebral palsy. This man had one secret wish, that his little girl could put her arms around him and say, Daddy, I love you, sit on his lap, and do the things that we would expect our little children to do. But she obviously couldn't because she was too profoundly retarded and didn't have the motor coordination. She was in a wheelchair. Before he went to George, he was in his hotel room and he said, Oh, honey, if you're there, please just tell me, just say, Daddy, I love you. Put your arms around me. Tell me you'd give me a kiss. Something along those lines. I'm seeing wheels like a, a bicycle. Uh, um, it's, it's, a, no, it's a wheelchair. She was in a wheelchair. Your daughter was in a wheelchair. George goes through the whole reading and there's a tremendous amount of accurate details. And the reading is about to end. And George is concluding, and says, oh, one more thing, George says to the anonymous subject of this man. Your little girl is saying, she's on your lap. I love you, Daddy. Daddy, I, I love you. And she wants to tell you, Daddy, that she's, that she's now hugging you, and she, she, she wants to give you a kiss. She wants to let you know that she's giving you a kiss now. And that's... He says it seems very ordinary, but that's extraordinary. And then she handed him back a teddy, teddy bear. She, oh. I, I don't, I don't, don't. She, yes, she's giving you back a teddy bear. That was her favorite toy. And when we buried her, there wasn't enough room in the casket. It is a vulnerable period for those of us left to mourn. It opens us to charlatans and trickery. With no motive, other than to explore the truth of his ability, we set up a series of sessions at his home on Long Island, New York.
These four women have come a long way to meet George Anderson. One has waited a year. The other three have traveled across the United States, all burdened with tragedy and burning with the question, could this be the culmination of unbearable grief or is it all for nothing? Otherwise, they are each normal, sensible women. This is Linda. She mourns the loss of her mother, Helen. Oh, we were very close. You know, very close, like sisters. These two are mother and daughter, Norma and Susan. They lost their loving husband and father, Tom, to a gunman's bullet. I kept, you know, thinking, I'm going to wake up and just this is going to be all behind me. In startling encounters with Anderson, they would weep and express dramatic and profound reactions to his words. Their sessions will be the subject of future stories. But our first session tonight is with Andrea Pratt. She lost her husband, Dan, to violent death. And just three years later, her darling son, Nick. We flew her in from California. Anderson has not met her before this moment. The session we are about to witness is as it happened. Any editing is for time purposes only. Anderson has been told nothing. She is a policeman's widow. Her husband, Dan, shot dead on the job five years ago. And then, even as she was still in mourning, her five-year-old son, Nick, was killed in a freak car accident. Andrea admits life's tortures have left her drained. And of the four women, she has come to Anderson with the least expectation, though in search of the same finality to her grief. Andrea and Dan had been high school sweethearts. He was just 30 and an LA cop. She was pregnant with their fourth child when a bullet killed their dreams. There was a knock on the door at half past midnight, September the 3rd, 1988. The knock every police wife dreads. I opened the door, but my brother was standing at the front door. My brother's also a LAPD officer. My brother didn't even have to tell me I knew. I just said, how bad is it? And he just, my brother started crying. And so then I asked him, I said, did he have his vest on? And he said, yes, he, he was hit in the head. Dan was shot in the face at point-blank range. And then, almost two years ago, Andrea lost their beloved little boy, Nick. The kids had wanted to walk to school with their other friends. Amanda and Danny had walked home every day since school started, but Nicholas was in kindergarten, so I picked him up every day. So uh, this was the third day they had walked to school by themselves. They were with two other children. and. Um, the bell rang for them to go into class, and at that point, Nicholas was the first in the pack to head across the parking lot. When uh, a lady in the van was, apparently just didn't see him, and uh, she struck him. She was going approximately 15 miles an hour. And uh, he fell to his knees, and she stopped because she heard people yelling, and um, she heard someone screaming, Mommy. Well, that was Nicholas screaming for me but she thought it was her son. So she was looking at her son, and then she went forward, and when she went forward, she killed him instantly. I, I can literally sit in the living room and visualize him in the backyard playing with the dogs or, or hear him laughing after a year and a half. He was very much a daddy's boy. Both my boys were. And even after my husband died, Nick was two and a half, and he, he cried for his dad all the way up till he died. He always wanted his dad around. Again, listen to Anderson's first words. A male close to you passed over? Yes. Two? Yes. One younger, one older? Yes. There is violence in the passing? Yes. Because there's bloodshed in front yes. of you. So there's obviously violence in the passing and great tragedy. There is a weapon in his passing? Yes. Yeah, because I... Again, though, it affects him more internally. Yes. Why does he tell me there's a weapon involved, and yet 
I mean, don't say anything, but why is he saying there's a weapon involved and yet it affects him internally? Seems to make a contradiction in my mind, but... In essence, he's basically at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes. I hear gunshots, and I'm just trying yes. to make sure that before I open my big mouth that this is what he's trying to tell me, because they can be symbols of weapons. Obviously, he is shot. Yes. Okay. Shot to the head? Yes. Because it feels like one clean shot to the head. Yes. Puts a big heart in front of you. Were you and he romantically involved? Or is that just this? Yes. You are. Okay, because that can also be a symbol of great fondness. No. So I'm trying to figure out what does he want me to say by this. So I assume... Mm. You're married? Emotionally? No, no, I was married. You married up to him at the time of passing? Yes. Yeah, because he says we were, were married. We're husband and wife. That's why he said was married to me. He says, what do you mean was, is? He seemed to react to that in any case. He working when he passes? Yes. He's talking about being killed on the job. Yes. So he must have been working at the time of passing. Um, he's caught by surprise, though, yes? Yes. Because this is not... It's almost as if he's responding to a routine call or something. Yes. And then all of a sudden, bingo. Um, he's caught by surprise. I see him, feel I see him behind you. A uniform involved with his work? Yes. Because I feel him in uniform behind you. I would assume he had to be a policeman, yes? Yes. Suddenly, Anderson picks up the name of Andrea's grandfather. Somebody around you claiming to be father. I'll have to go with grandfather. Name William, you know? Yes. And then, husband Dan's. Well, saying Harry doesn't mean you know, does it? Yes. Is that the other granddad? It's his granddad. Is there also another young male close to you passed on? Yes. Other than your husband? This talk of a son. Did you lose a son? Yes. Oh. A vehicle involved in his passing? Yes. Because he keeps telling me a car accident, but not the way I'm going to think, but a vehicle's involved. Yes. There's a hit. He hit? Yes. Also injury to the head, too? Yes. Yeah, because it's definitely a strike to the head or a, from the hit or whatever, and it seems this kills him instantly. Unfortunately, this is a careless accident. Yes. Because that's, your son doesn't blame anyone. He embraces you with love along with your husband. Just know that the two of them are together, along with your grandparents, your other relatives, of course, that have passed on. And they ask you to continue to go on with your life as best you can until we're all together again, until we meet again, which will happen. As much as sometimes you might want it to be tomorrow, you have to go on to get through this one. Nick, who loves you? God loves me. Who else? And Jesus. All right. Was there contact with the dead this day? Neither Andrea nor we can be sure. Since that session some weeks ago, we have stayed in contact with Andrea Pratt, and she remains convinced of one fact. Whether or not contact was made with the departed, her life has fundamentally changed since she met George Anderson. Since hearing that her son does not blame anyone for his death, Andrea says she too has learned to forgive.